Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Van, your friendly neighborhood English teacher, and I am super excited about today's class because I wasn't going to get to do this story and now I do. So I think we're going to have a really good time with it. So let's see. Um, are there any sci-fi fans here in general? Like how many of you tend to sci-fi and by sci-fi let's be really broad like even that kind of fantasy one as well so looking for this um see if any of you just like sci-fi in general because this, this is the only sci-fi story that we've read so there we go um all right and so my one to five so i see some of you some of you who are normally in the class and know how this works had already started giving me my numbers so there you go um i'm seeing my numbers come through and so it looks like some of you kind of like sci-fi maybe you like sci-fi so remember a one is that you hated the story you can't believe i picked this one you're like mrs van you let us down a five is oh mrs van you saved the best for last right like so what did you think what did you think lots of different your numbers are all over the place today interesting your numbers are all over the place mm. well let's see let's see um all right, so let's look at what was going on in the class on Friday. So some shout outs of some of the things that I took note of in the comments. So how is that? I just woke up and I was like, oh no, I'm late to Mrs. Van Star's class. And I thought that was so funny because in real life, in, in a real classroom, if a kid comes in tardy, I always say the same thing a hundred times, which is, oh, don't worry, the bell's just a guideline, come whenever you want, which of course I don't mean. But somewhere around October, November, I don't have to say that anymore. And all the other students will say it when someone comes in late. Okay, so Muslim, I said, I think it's sad that he would kill someone for money. And of course, we're talking about the bet. We're talking about the story of the bet that we talked about on Friday. And I agree. Like, to me, that's one of the saddest things that while the lawyer was having this big life experience and change and learning and growing, and whether you agree or disagree with the end conclusion he came to make, it's pretty obvious that he's changing and growing, and yet the banker is just devolving into this horrible person. All right, Aaron said, at the beginning of the story, I agreed with the host that a quick death would be better, but then I agreed with the lawyer that you can make the best of your time spent alone. And I liked this comment because I think it has a broader application too, right? Like Aaron's right, not just about this, but about everything in general, which is that you can make the best use of whatever happens to you. Like you can make the best use of this time in quarantine, like, or whatever you're dealing with right now, right? You can make the best use of it. And some people will, and some people won't, right? Um, then we had um, this quote, which I really liked, if you, because <laughs> it made me laugh out loud. If you experience capital punishment, you can't exactly share the experience. <laughs> like true, right? Yes, that is true. And I love this one. It reveals something about the banker's spiritual bankruptcy that he doesn't understand why the lawyer would spend that much time reading the New Testament. I, I felt like that was really a good point, right? Like that it did show something about him. It told us something about the banker. Um, okay, so sorry, you were seeing my cursor fly. And then oh, Ryan's comment that it's sad that he, and this by he, he means the lawyer, that he um, refers to God, but hates all the gifts of God. I, was, I thought that was a really insightful comment there. Um, okay, and then talking about, I mentioned that I was reading Harry Potter and it fell in the bathtub. And, um, and two of you comment on that, that Kurt said, I've dropped many books in the bathtub. And Ryan said, I like to read in the tub. It helps the story soak in. And I just... That is an awesome dad joke, Ryan, even though I know that you are not old enough to be a dad. I just, that made me laugh. So actually, and I hope he doesn't mind my saying this, I have known Ryan since, um, let's see, well, before he was born because I have known his mom for, um, oh, 100 years. Okay. Um, and then I like this, two different people had two different takes on who won the bet. Kurt says the lawyer wins. The winner of any bet is a person who comes out of it happier. And it seems clear that the lawyer's happiness does not falter so much in wisdom as the banker's does in rashness, which I thought was interesting. And then Amelia Jane, sorry, my head's in the way of this. The banker wins the bet in every way. He has the possibility of recovering. He loses nothing while the lawyer loses everything, his sanity, his health. And that was the last thing it said was his health. So that was interesting that you both took 
um, took it away. Um, took away totally different things from it. Aaron, I loved this possibility, right? What if the lawyer wrote the letter to the banker, but then ended up following through with the bet anyway just to prove it to the banker and oh I like what a plot twist I mean so you probably are familiar with the idea of fan fiction right where like somebody rewrites Pride and Prejudice or retells it in some way or adds a sequel or does a spin-off or something and I think like this premise could be awesome fan fiction for this because oh that would be <laughs> what a twist and then I just had to call out um and this one from the gerund poems that you guys wrote, which was Mrs. Van's class is reading, thinking, analyzing, joking about toilet paper. So I love this. Um, that is so funny. Oh, I can't be a day. I am. I'll tell you how old I am. I am 53. I am 53 years old. Okay, so ready to dive into all summer in a day, which I have to tell you is funny. My husband is Australian and um, he loves this band that's Australian and they have a song called four seasons in one day and I kept thinking of it all through this story because it was all summer in a day okay so we're gonna do what we always do which is revisit the plot to make sure that we're all on the same page so let's see if you guys agree with me because remember that um, there's no right or wrong here meaning that you're welcome to disagree and so, in fact, I think in one story, I changed my mind about what the climax was at one point. So, uh, the backstory is there's this group of nine-year-olds living on Venus in constant rain, which, um, and, they're, and they're in some kind of boarding school because at one point she makes reference to the fact, or the narrator comments that Margot could hear them, like, in the night while they were sleeping, and that wouldn't be possible if they were all at their houses so apparently it's some kind of boarding school and what's weird about it is that venus is like in constant rain when that's the opposite of what the real planet venus is like and so i think this gives us a glimpse into the idea that as an author you have some artistic license right that you can write things that aren't necessarily scientifically true i would say that in contemporary science fiction readers are much more discerning about this than they used to be so at the time that bradbury was writing you could write something and it could be incompatible with the science and readers would give you a pass, but I don't think that that's true. Okay, so yeah, and the rain on Venus is sulfuric acid. So yeah, nobody really wants to live on Venus. Okay, so then to me, the inciting incident is that the sun is going to come out. Like the sun on this planet only comes out once every seven years and what sets this story in motion is today is the day right? Okay. And um, then I, I think the rising action is where we're getting information about their life on Venus, information about how Margot is bullied by these people and kind of how that arose and how she is ostracized. And that ostracism is essential for when we get to the climax. And I will tell you, I'm very curious to see about this, what you think, because I really debated back and forth, like, is the climax when they lock Margo in the closet or is the climax when the sun comes out? And I don't know. I'm wondering if there could be two climactic moments, like one for Margo and one for like that storyline of Margo. And it makes me wonder if maybe we have like two different stories running through here together. One is the story of Margo her ostracism and bullying and another the story of this group of children who never see the sun or rarely see the sun and that so each of those stories has its own climax curious about what you think about this um so we'll see but one of those is the climax in my opinion um okay and then falling action the kids get to play in the sunshine it starts to rain again and they remember margo and then the resolution they let Margot out of the closet. So this is a story with a lot of room for interpretation. Um, oh, Heidi says, I always thought it was pronounced Margot. Yeah, the it's a French name. So the O, it just it ends in an O sound. So it's different because I speak some German and some French. And in German, you pronounce every letter no matter how painful. And in French, you have a sentence this long. And when you say it, it sounds like it's this long. So they're very different in their pronunciation. Um, okay, so curious about what you think, and now here we go. Well, we have, oops, what happened? This is the beginning of the story. 
it had been raining for seven years. Now, I don't think it's an accident that Bradbury picks seven here because seven is commonly used as a symbol of completeness. So um, like like seven days in a week or in the Bible, uh, when Joshua marches around the city of Jericho seven times and seven days and blows the trumpet seven times, it's like a symbol of um of completeness that like you're done. And so I think Bradbury is using this on purpose to symbolize it's been raining forever. Like it is always raining. It rains all the time. And now we have a great big whale of a word, anaphora, that we learned in um, a previous story. And we see it here. With the drum and gush of water, with the sweet crystal fall of showers. Nice. So we have the with the, with the, that repetition at the beginning of a phrase is called anaphora. But then we get this interesting one I wanted to point out to you just as a little bonus for those of you who like being in the in crowd. So a thousand forests have been crushed and grown up a thousand times. So you see this a thousand and when you see it at the beginning and then you see it at the end, that is a form of repetition called a panalepsis. Isn't that a crazy word? Like you might want to screenshot that because that is the word of the day. So that's when I put something at the beginning and then I put something at the end and it's a different form of repetition. So you don't see it very often. So shout out to Ray Bradbury for letting me use my fancy English teacher word. And then you get this feeling here where he's he's wanting us to feel like this is never going to end. This was the way life was for ever and they're going to live out their lives right like this is lasting forever forever okay so and then another thing he's going to emphasize is this this is our very first glimpse of Margot. she stands apart from them and and bradbury is completely emphasizing the apartness over and over and over again, we're going to see him return to this idea that Margot is different. Margot is separate. Margot is, is apart. And in this one, in this particular sentence, Bradbury is doing two things. He's emphasizing her isolation and he's making sure that we know that this is a life of rain. And look at that repetition, right? Rain, 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 rain. And we know that from his structure that there's somehow a connection between the rain, 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 and the people who live that way and Margot. That that is that is the um, that is the distinction. That's why she's different. So I've I've italicized here a personification that Bradbury uses, and he is absolutely famous for his figurative language. So you'll be seeing a lot of it today. He is famous for it. So, um, and Kurt Kemmer says, what about four? I know that lots of authors use other numbers. Lots of numbers have symbolism associated with them, and you see them used. There are lots of them, right? Um, I'm pointing out seven because that's what they said. So, they were all nine years old, and if if there had been a day when the sun came out and showed its face, that's the personification, they didn't remember, right? So these are all kids who lived in in on a planet where it only the sun only comes out once every seven years. They're only nine years old. Therefore, they don't remember the last time it came out because they were only two years old. And the issue is that you you can't form memory really, really early. And we're not 100% sure why. It probably has a lot to do with language development and just neural development. But there is an there is a point at which it, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It's just you, you aren't physically capable of forming a, a rememberable memory before a certain age. People who tell you that they remember when they were tiny babies or remember being born, they're, I'm not going to say they're lying because I don't want to call someone a liar, but they're not telling the truth. All right, so I'm curious, what's your first memory that you know is really yours? Like, not just something that was told to you, not just something like, oh, when you were a baby, blah, 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 blah. But what is what is your earliest memory that you really remember? And I'm curious there. And I'll watch for those to come in. So then Bradbury says this, uh, they were dreaming and remembering gold or a yellow crayon or a coin large enough to buy the world with. And he just infuses us with all of these yellows and this idea. And this is the part that I meant where 
this is what Margot sees and like she she is aware of them sleeping and so we know that there's something and this imagery is really powerful because of that connector or that remembering gold or a yellow crayon or a coin large enough to buy the world with and that is another whale of a word it is called polysyndeton now what's funny is if you go like google pronounce polysyndeton you will see like 10 different ways to say it. And you, one of the most common, in addition to the one I say, is polysyndeton. And it's fine if you want to say it that way. So polysyndeton or polysyndeton. And what that is, is when we use these connectors and they are either or or and. And you will see, you will see it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one later. So um, I know it surprises you that there's a big fancy English teacher word for it, right? And, and we have these words so that we can talk with each other, so that we can say, I think this could be strengthened by some polysyndeton, which is a single word, rather than saying, I think this would be strengthened if you repeated the same, uh, if you repeated phrases connecting them with a connector like or or and, right? That's so long. And so we have these words so we can talk to each other and be understood, right? So it sounds like a hormone. That's hysterical, Tabitha. Um, so again, polysyndeton is a list or series of words or phrases or clauses that is connected, like this list is connected by the use of the same conjunction. And the most common conjunction in polysyndeton is are or and and. Okay, so then we hear this, that they, um, that they talked about like how like a lemon it was. So they're learning in school about the... Um, about the sun and they learn about how like a lemon it was and that was just kind of an interesting thing to me because I was curious like in what ways do you think the sun is like a lemon and in what ways is it not oh I'm seeing some of your memories Ooh, Elliot I want to know how old you were when your brother cut your hair interesting and Christiana, I want to know how old you were when you drew in your dad's car. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so in what way is the sun like a lemon? Okay, it's yellow. It's yellow. It's not sour, right? Yeah, it's not sour. The sun is the sun is not sour. Lemon is sour. So I'm curious. I'm watching these come through. I Yeah, a lot of you are picking up on this yellow, and I was thinking, I just don't know how strong of a simile that is, because if you only have one characteristic the same, and it's not that defining, I mean, there are lots of things that are yellow. I, I don't know. I just didn't feel like it was that strong of a simile. Oh, the game hound. It's sour to your eyes. Ooh, okay, and Heidi picked up on that idea, too, and Simon did, too. Oh, okay, all right. You guys have converted me. Good job. Okay, and then this is Margot's poem. I think the sun is a flower that blooms for just one hour. And all the kids are like, no, it's not. No, it's not. And But but here's what they really do, right? They tell her she cheated. You didn't write that. And she's like, yes, you, yes, I did. And I thought this was so coincidental because when I was in second grade, I was in a second and third grade combination class, and I had to write a haiku poem, if any of you had to write a haiku. And I wrote this haiku poem, and all the kids in my class accused me of cheating. And when I read this story, I was like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing to get accused of cheating in writing your poem. And I actually did write that poem, but apparently, you know, it's a thing. So here we get Margot's separateness again, right? This separateness. And I want to point out the structure in this sentence that Bradbury uses because he is a master. Do you guys remember when I, when we read To Build a Fire and I said that was going to be the most masterful story that we read? I would say that that was true through the initial class, I would say that that London and Bradbury are equal in mastery. And you see that here. So we've got Margot alone and separate, which we know is key, right? He's already established that. And now Bradbury uses color to emphasize her otherness. She is no longer the colors she was born with. And I've highlighted the polysyndeton for you. Okay. She was very frail. She looked as if she had been lost in the rain for years, right? Now, you're an other if you're lost in the rain for years, because if you're lost in the rain for years, nobody wanted to find you, right? 
and the rain had washed out the blue from her eyes. So she was supposed to have had blue eyes and now she doesn't. There's just no color to them. Washed out the red from her mouth. Her lips are colorless and the yellow from her hair. So we get that. Washed out the blue from her eyes and the red from her mouth and the yellow from her hair. So rather than using commas to separate this, right? Because he could have said, wash out the blue from her eyes, comma, the red from her mouth, comma, and the yellow from her hair. Rather than use commas, he's using these conjunctions. And that is a particular technique. And you as a writer have to decide, is this a technique I want in my toolbox? Like, is this something I want to try? You try it for emphasis. You want to make sure that you're emphasizing something when you do it. Otherwise, you just sound like you don't know how to use commas. And this, I pulled this old photo, I found, I went and found, there used to be this camera called a Polaroid, and I actually think they still make them, but in a Polaroid camera, you would take a picture and it prints it instantly, but they frequently fade over time in a way that regular pictures don't as badly. And so she was an old photograph dusted from an album, whitened away, and I just wanted to show you this old one so you could see like what that looks like, like you can't even really see, you have to squint kind of, and if you don't know the person, you wouldn't recognize them. And if she spoke at all, her voice would be a ghost. Not her voice would be like that of a ghost, but her voice would be its own ghost, like disembodied. And now she stood separate, looking at the rain and the loud, wet world. So again, this emphasis on the separateness more and more and more. So interesting. Okay. So here, here's what I don't understand. Here's what I don't, I, well, I do understand it. I'm curious. Why do you think this is true? The kids don't see, I mean, I have an idea, not necessarily the right one. Remember, I, I don't make all the right ideas, but I have one idea. I'm curious if you have the same idea. They don't see the sun either. Like they haven't seen the sun. She, she hasn't seen the sun since she was four. She's nine. She hasn't seen the sun in five years. They haven't seen the sun in seven years. Why is it so much worse for her? Like why is, why are those two years when she was a small child? Why is that the root cause of this separateness? Curious, curious, curious. Oh, Amelia, Polaroids are trendy and popular now. There you go. So I'm curious. I'm going to watch for those answers to come through. Okay, and then here goes this separateness again. And there's this weird cycle that Bradbury picks up on, and I actually think it's pretty, pretty common in my experience. And they say they edged away from her. They wouldn't look at her. She felt them go away. And this was because she would play no games with them. If they tagged her and ran, she stood blinking after them and didn't follow. So it's like this cycle that they ostracize her and she self-isolates. And so then she gets more isolated and then they cycle down into this bullying. And so... I feel like Bradbury has picked up on this idea of this cycle of bullying and isolation that people who get bullied isolate and then they get more bullied and it just becomes this vicious cycle. And I think it's kind of interesting that bullying and isolation form a symbiotic relationship where neither can exist without the other. Like you cannot effectively bully someone who's integrated in a strong social network. It just won't work, right? Because other people will call you out. Um, it's very difficult to tease out which came first, which came first, the bullying or the isolation. And it's very difficult to predict what could break it. Like if you automatically stopped, if you were able to stop the person from being bullied, meaning you were able to stop the bullies, would the person stop being isolated? Would they rejoin the group? Or what if the person just forces their way back into the group and refuses to be isolated? Would it stop the bullying? Just kind of interesting, just kind of interesting. Um, Anna says that it, it's worse for her because they haven't seen this. They've, she's seen the sun and remembers it and they haven't, and they can't miss, you know, essentially what they don't remember. So then, okay. I have seen in a lot of analysis on this story. Like if you Google all summer in a day analysis, I guarantee you that you will find someone who says that one of the main themes in this story is that of jealousy that the people are jealous of her, the other kids are jealous of her. And every time I see that, especially on a website that's supposed to be like a literary analysis website or a place where people are supposed to know what they're talking about, it makes me want to pull out big chunks of my hair because they're misusing the word jealousy. Jealousy is when you already have something and someone is threatening it. You're 
you are worried that they're going to take away someone or something that you already have. You're afraid to lose something that you have. Jealousy would be where someone was looking at my pen and I became a teacher because like office supplies, so I'm very attached to my pens. And if somebody's looking at my pen like they want to take it, then I would be jealous of it. Like, don't take my pen. Again, with the biblical illusion, which I said in an early class, it doesn't matter what religion you are. You need to read the Bible if you're going to understand literature. It, it will say, I am a jealous God. It doesn't mean God wants something that other people have. I mean, by definition, God could just get anything he wants. What it means is, I want what is mine. I want what is mine. I want to keep what is mine. Envy is when you want something that someone else has. Envy is when you have a pen and I don't even have a pen and I want your pen. That's envy. And in order to envy, you have to lack, right? Like if, if you have a pen and I have a pen, I'm not going to envy your pen because I got the same pen, right? So envy implies a lack of something. I don't have something. You have it. I want it. That's envy. I have something. You want it. That's jealousy. Okay. I hope that makes sense. And you will be um, just in the top 1% of people of English speakers who use these words correctly if you start using them correctly. And I want to apologize right now because you're going to now notice all the ways that people use them wrong, including your teachers. So just think to yourself, you're not saying that right. And do not feel that you need to correct them in front of everybody. Here we go. Okay. So next, then she says, uh, Margot tells them the sun is like a penny. And they say, no, it's not. And then she says, the sun is like a fire in the stove. And to both of these similes, the children argue, no, it's not. And I'm thinking when I read the story for the first time, um, and you know this because, like, you know better than her because it's just so weird when people say that someone doesn't know something that they know. Um, it, I just thought that was so, so bizarre. And, and I want to address a little point here that I think it brings it up, um, which is they say, you're lying. You don't remember, cry the children. And I think that this is an important thing. This isn't Bradbury's line. This is mine, that privilege has a price. And I think Margot pays the price of the privilege of having lived in the sun. So privilege is, the definition of privilege is that it is a special right or advantage or immunity. Okay, a, a right, an advantage, or an immunity granted or available only to a certain group of people, right? And we usually think of it as advantageous. I mean, that's right in the definition. It is an, ad, an advantage or an immunity. Um, but here, Margot represents like the, the price of, of privilege because in her case, it becomes a disadvantage. Her privilege of having lived in the sun makes her a target. And people will often attack you. Like if you're in a group of people and you're the only one with that privilege, they will attack you over it. Margot's memories of the sun, which some would consider a privilege, right? An advantage only offered to a certain group, make her other. And part of us wants to say like, she's the only one who remembers and you were... You, like she's the only one who remembers and rather than trying to find out from her what it's like and kind of bask in the reflected rays of the sun with her, you attack her over it and it makes absolutely no sense. All right, so vote, you guys. I want to hear, what do you think? Which one is most accurate? We've heard these four comparisons of the sun. It is like a lemon. That's what the teacher taught them. Um, a flower, which was what was in her poem. A penny, that she tells them in her simile, or fire in the stove. Which one do you think it was most like? Jay San thinks I should be a philosopher. You know, I think in some ways all good thinkers are philosophers um, because if you love knowledge, you can't help but want to think about things. Uh, and Mariana or Mariana says, I hate it when someone tells me they know something or they like, I hate it when someone insists that they know something and they're, they're wrong. It's so annoying. Oh, wow. You guys are all over the place on this fire or flower, fire or flower. That's interesting. 
Ryan had an interesting comment go by, but the chat's going so fast. I couldn't quite catch it. I'm going to have to go back and look at that one. Fire flower, fire flower. Very few of the others. Interesting. Okay, so it's gotten, it's so bad. It's so bad that there's talk that her father and mother are going to take her back to earth next year. And it seemed vital to her that they do so, right? She really wants them to, even though it would mean the loss of thousands of dollars to her family. And what's interesting about that. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Ryan put it again. The fact that they bully her is kind of like in the story home that we read when they lie to themselves so that they don't feel they will miss the home. But this time it's the son they're lying to themselves about. That is a beautiful connection. And I think that there is a connection between this story and home. And I think there's a connection between this story and Muffin as well. Okay, so um, in the bullying, right? So thank you for reposting that, Ryan. Um, so I think that this, though, becomes another point where she gets bullied because her parents have enough money to give up the thousands of dollars that it would cost them to go back to, to Earth from Venus. And so now, not only is she other because she lived on Earth longer, but now she might get to go back. And so her parents are thinking of doing this nice thing for her, but even the consideration of it makes it worse for her. It's so interesting. So they're talking about the sun coming out that day, and now is when it really goes badly for her because William, the bad boy, she turns for the first time and she looks at him, and what she was waiting for was in her eyes. Like he could see in her eyes how much she wanted it. And that is when it all goes downhill. Like I think you could maybe make the, I, you could make the argument this is almost a second inciting incident or an echo inciting incident because it's his recognizing that she wants it that sets the action in motion. Kind of interesting. And he says, oh, no, it's not really coming out today. And they all blinked at him and then understanding laughed and shook their heads. So now they all realize um, oh, that what he wants them to do. He wants to, them to be in on his game that he's going to play against her, that the sun isn't really coming out that day. And this is the first glimpse of the mob. We get the mob mentality here. And it is so creepy. And it's especially creepy if you've read this story. So this is such a Lord of the Flies moment. So let's look at the moment and then I'll talk about why it's the Lord of the Flies moment. They surged about her, caught her up and bore her protesting and then pleading and then crying back into a tunnel, a room, a closet. So you see them moving, right? They're in a tunnel. They're in a room. They're in a closet in the room. So she's in a closet, in a room, in a tunnel where they slammed and locked the door. They stood looking at the door and saw it tremble from her beating and throwing herself against it. They heard her muffled cries and then smiling... They turned and went out and back down the tunnel just as the teacher arrived. Right? And the, okay, if you haven't read The Lord of the Flies, this is a Lord of the Flies moment. So Lord of the Flies is a book. It's written by a British author named William Golding. And it is a, it is a very short book. Like you could read it this afternoon. It, unless you have a bunch of other stuff you have to do, but like that's how short it is. So in Lord of the Flies, a bunch of British schoolboys who should be very refined, right? We always think of the British as being like more polite than we are in, in the United States at least. Um, and uh, they end up on an island and it all goes downhill very, very, very quickly. <laughs> There's a lot of behavior like this, <laughs> right? So if you haven't read Lord of the Flies, you, you've already got a little glimpse of it. Okay, so then... The, the teacher comes in and she's like, ready, children? Yes. Are we all here? Yes. And I'm like, liars, right? Liar, liar, pants on fire. Margo is not there. Oh, and you know what this reminded me of? The lottery. It reminded me of the lottery. It's like a reverse lottery. Is everybody here for the good thing? In that story, was everybody here for the old thing? Um, and Jackson Williams says, you're reading Lord of the Flies. Um, and you would like it if you didn't have to do questions about it. Ugh, I know. I know. Right, Jackson? Ugh, it's the worst. Okay. I know. Your teacher should do a live stream about Lord of the Flies. Okay. And then, and then this is what it's like. This is what it's like for them. And I think that this is really interesting because the emphasis that, that um, Bradbury has is not on the, the actual sight. It's on the sound. And it says, it was as if in the midst of a film concerning an avalanche, a tornado, a hurricane, a volcanic eruption. So it was all this loud stuff. Something had at first gone wrong with the sound apparatus, thus muffling and finally cutting off all noise, all the blasts and repercussions and thunders, and then second, ripped the film from the projector and inserted in its place a peaceful tropical scene which did not move or tremor. And so what he emphasizes is not the sight of the sun, but the sound of the silence. 
Ooh, I didn't even intend that alliteration. Oh, 10 points to Ravenclaw. All right. The silence was so immense and unbelievable that you felt your ears have been stuffed or you had lost your hearing altogether. Notice how he shifts into the second person. He's trying to make us feel it. Your hearing, your ears, right? And the children put their hands to their ears. The way he describes the sound of the silence is so immense. And, and we get this, the sun came out. And this is this tension that's been building because he's been using a repeated phrase. The rain slackened. The rain continued to slacken. And now the sun came out. And he's going to use a similar, just super short phrase, very short phrase, right? Our noun phrase, the sun, and then this predicate phrase came out, right? And that is it. Bradbury uses so many references to color in this story. And then Will says, can you do a class on Lord of the Flies after you come back from your surgery? And meanwhile, we can read it. Wow. Uh, okay, I got to think about that one because it would take quite a bit of time. Like, it would, yeah, but maybe... I'll think about it. I promise I will think about it. All right. The sun comes out. And Bradbury uses so many references to color. And I think this was interesting. The bronze one here is interesting to me. He says it was the color of flaming bronze and it was very large. And that was interesting to me because remember when Margot said it was, that the sun was like a penny and they all argued that no, it wasn't. Well, there's a very rare U.S. currency penny made of bronze and it's worth a lot of money it's really valuable and so I think it's interesting that she says like it's it's like a penny and they say it's not but then when the sun comes out it's bronze and there is a penny that's bronze even though pennies are supposedly made of copper so I also think it's interesting that it's not just the color of the sun itself that's so saturated and intense but the sun makes the colors of everything around it right the sky around it is a blazing blue tile color so it isn't just that they haven't got to see the sun it's the effect of on color of everything that they see because there's no sun and then the verbs right Look at these ing words. I highlighted all of these ing words. They were running and turning and feeling and taking and letting, right? Just that power of the ing words. And we've looked at a couple different kinds of ing words. We've looked at present participles and we've looked at gerunds. And I just want you, again, don't worry about what they're called. Just recognize there's some power in the ing word. And can I liven up my writing through a series of ing words to create a sense of motion or excitement? And then now it talks about the forest and here's Polly Sindeton again, only this time, only this time with and instead of or it was a nest of octopuses and yeah, clustering up great arms of flesh like weed wavering flowering this brief spring. It was the color of rubber and ash, this jungle from the many years without the no, there's no polysyndeton in here. What was I thinking? I had notes on there, but it isn't. I don't see it. Maybe I'm ahead of myself in my notes. It was the color of stones and white cheeses and ink. It was the color of the moon. There's no polysyndeton here. Lisa, there you just, I just lost my Ravenclaw 10 points. 10 points from Ravenclaw. Uh, sorry about that, guys. All right, here we go. If I, maybe it'll come up later. Um, but look at, look at how she describes it, right? This grayness, it was the color of rubber and ash. And we think of jungles as being green and full of life, but here it's not. It's the color of stone, so gray and white cheese and ink. And it was the color of the moon. And all of these things, like Bradbury is just throwing all of this imagery at us. Oh, ash doesn't do it for you. Rubber doesn't do it for you. Let me give you stone. Let me give you white cheese. Let me give you ink. Let me give you the moon. Like, can you see what I'm talking about? He just inundates us with this color imagery. So sometimes as a writer, you might want to give more imagery because not every reader is going to have a connection to that thing that you're describing and you need to give them more of the words. The children lay out laughing on the jungle mattress and heard it sigh and squeak under them, resilient and alive. And this metaphor that the jungle is a mattress, it's like they're all jumping on a bed, right? And we're hearing it squeak. That's the poly... Oh, oh, wait, somebody was saying I got it. Let's see. And it was the color. It was a desk. No, I don't see it. I, somebody is trying to save me from my mistake, but I didn't see even the correction. Okay, so Bradbury focuses on all of the things that they can do because of the sun. And to do this, he uses verbs. And while he often uses that strong figurative language, and we've been seeing it in this paragraph, it's all about the verbs. It's all about the action. Notice the simile here. When we, we get to the bottom, we're going to get a powerful simile. 
I, I've highlighted in orange, but I've got all the verbs in blue. They ran, they slipped, they fell, they pushed, they played, they put their hands up, they breathed, they listened, they listened, they, and um, the silence is suspended. They looked, they savored. Usually the verb savor is used with food. It's almost like they're eating this. It's going into them. They ran and they ran and they ran and they didn't stop running. Okay, so that ran and ran and ran and didn't stop running. That's a beautiful repetition. Um, and then the this, like animals escape from their caves. This is something I want to point out. This simile is interesting because normally would say, like animals escape from a zoo. But here, like animals escape from a cave. Why? Because zoos have sunshine. Zoos, animals can go out. Caves are dark. These are like animals escape from a cave, not animals escape from a zoo. Interesting. Oh, he's so beautiful. All right. Do you, uh, so one of the things I thought when I first read this story was that he, he's very much emphasizing all this running around. And I thought, why? Like, why all this running around? Is it just that they don't normally run or is it the experience of running in the sun is really different from running in the rain? I'm not really sure. Not really sure. Um, I'm curious what you think, right? Like, do you think that they run all the time and it's just different in the sun or do you think he emphasizes the running because normally in all that rain they don't run around Polly Sinditon was with the stones and the white cheese and the ink oh thank you thank you I feel so much better I really do appreciate that thank you thank you teacher likes books right, and then everyone stopped and here we get this short 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 sentence again remember the rain slackened the sun came out everyone stopped this is punctuation. He's using words as punctuation. And when you guys vary your sentence length, it becomes its own punctuation. So when you're writing, make sure that you use a variety of sentence length, right? Some longer sentences, some shorter sentences, because then your, then your sentences can serve as punctuation for you. And Bradbury's doing exactly that. He's such a genius. I mean, he brings the whole thing to a grinding halt with the same kind of abrupt sentence that he's used to do the buildup to. All right, so now... Then one of them gave a little cry. Margo, what? She's still in the closet where we locked her. And then this, this line. They stood as if someone had driven them like so many stakes. And then this, this, um, this simile, like they had been driven like this, like stakes into the ground, right? Like wooden stakes that you would drive into the ground, like for a tent. And they looked at each other. And then looked away. They glanced out at the world that was raining now and raining and raining steadily. And we've got that polysyndeton here. They could not meet each other's glances. Their faces were solemn and pale. They looked down at their hands and feet, their faces down. They looked at their hands and feet, their faces down. And I think it's like one of those moments where you're like, well, that was awkward. Well, that was awkward. I mean, now they realize, oh, man. Okay. So... I think that they feel bad. Yeah, Moses, Moses says, yeah, like they they feel bad for locking her up. Ryan says, how did the teacher not hear that or see that Margot was gone? Okay, how the teacher didn't hear it was that they took her down the tunnel into a classroom with a closet, so the teacher wouldn't hear. And then why did the teacher not notice? And I think because when you have a large group of students, and we don't know how many kids these are, but when you have a large group of students – it's very easy when they're all clustered together not to instantly be able to look at a group and go, oh, there's 26 people here, right? And they asked, she asked them, was everybody here? And they said, yes. I've had that happen to me. I've had that happen to me in um, when I was teaching. When I took my kids out for a fire drill and got out there and I'm like, I'm one short, you know. So I think that what makes this really powerful is that they took this from her. But they didn't remember the sun. So they didn't know what they were stealing. And it made me think about, can bullies ever really know what they're stealing from you? Like a bully makes a decision to do something, to be mean to someone in some way. And I wonder if they can ever really know what they've done. Like here, I, I feel like the reason that they're ashamed, I feel, going back to this, I think that the reason that they react this way is because this is the first moment that they realize what they did because they had this abstract idea. Oh, we're going to lock her in a closet so she doesn't get to see it. But they didn't know what that meant. They didn't really understood, understand what that meant. And now they do because they've experienced it. 
And so I just wondered what you guys thought about whether that was true. Um, and Nadia says, I feel like the teacher should have noticed Margo wasn't there because she's isolated from the rest of the class and teachers usually notice that. I think that's a good point. I mean, of course, if she had noticed it, it would have ended the story. But I think that you you could make that argument. Of course, it's science fiction, so maybe teachers in these stories are less aware. I mean, maybe they're robots. But I think that was a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I'm curious what you think. Like, do bullies already know what they're doing? I, I, I just, to me, this was one, this, the second most important takeaway from the story. The most important takeaway is coming up. To me. Everybody has their own most important takeaway. They walk slowly down the hall in the sound of cold rain. They turn through the doorway to the room in the sound of the storm and thunder, lightning on their faces, blue and terrible. They walked over to the closet door slowly and stood by it. And you see, I mean, Bradbury is making the most of all of his skills. And one of the things he's doing is using this color, right? That the lightning is blue and terrible. We've seen blue used a lot in this story. We saw her eyes were blue that had been washed out. We had tile blue. And then we had a quote, amazing blueness when the sun was out. And now the blue is terrible. Um, so I think that Bradbury is just so highlighting this idea of the their hesitancy. Their, they don't want to do this. I mean, they know they have to let her out at some point, right? They know they have to, but they don't want to. And it, it is he is slowing us down. In the same way that he was racing and using all of those verbs in the and, in the and, in the and, in the and, here he slowed us way down, so we'll focus on this. It's a very strong sentence. Behind the closet door was only silence. And I think it's really important because we have to look at, remember what she, what it was like right after she got locked in the closet, right? Before the sun came out, this was the quote. This, they saw it tremble from her beating and throwing herself against it. They heard her muffled cries. So when they first locked her in the closet, this is what had happened. Behind the closet door was only silence. And then the last line, they unlock the door even more slowly and let Margot out. And the story ends. And the story ends, right? Yeah. And somebody commented, the, the um, Strudel Kitty says it's falling action. Yeah, the, the, he slows this whole story way down in the falling action. And then here's the resolution and let Margot out. And that's the way the story ends. I mean, we don't know what did they find when they let Margot out, like how was she acting? They don't, we don't know how Margot was feeling earlier. The narrator had gone into Margot's mind and we knew what she was thinking and feeling. And now we don't, the narrator completely shuts us off from, from her. Um, we don't know what happens after this. We don't know if the students get in trouble. We don't know anything. All we know is this. And in a weird way, in a weird way, cookie cookie says it's like a cliffhanger. And I think you're right. And it almost sets itself up for a sequel, right? Like, what happens? And I'm curious what you think. Why doesn't Bradbury describe how Margot acts, like, reacts? Why not just, like, why not just do that? Why end like this? Why leave us to make us figure that out? Some of you thought that she had died. Yeah, no, they let her out, right? So the only way for her to come out is if she's alive. So they let her out. So she's still alive. We, we've read too much Cask of Amontillado <laughs> and the bet. <laughs> we read too much death. All right. And, and Desiree's baby. <laughs> we read too much. All right. Oh, I hope I wasn't a spoiler for some of you who haven't taken the earlier classes. So, mm, Deb Coatney, to leave something for the reader to imagine. Yeah. Um. We have to make an in to add suspense. And that's really interesting, right? Because we don't normally get suspense at the end. So our theme through all of our stories has been justice. Our theme through all of our stories. And one of the things that I want to point out to you is that if somebody ever asks you to put together a couple of stories or even more stories and compare and contrast them, the best way to do that is not to look at nitpicky details of the stories, but rather to look at what overarching theme ties them together. That will give you a lot more to hang hang stuff on, right? And we've looked at justice and every single story, 
which I didn't, I just picked a, a generic universal theme out of my pile of universal themes and chose justice. Um, and a, and one of the stories I hadn't even read before, so I didn't even know if it would fit, but every story fit the theme. And I got this comment on my Gifted Guru Facebook page and I couldn't help but laugh. Best story ever, hashtag justice for Margot. And I just couldn't help but laugh because it's like, that's exactly what we're looking at this story through is the theme of justice. And I wonder, do you think it's possible for just to get justice for Margot? Like, what could the teacher have done? What, what could the teacher have done? NH says that by not giving us a clear ending, it makes it the story continue in our mind. Oh, interesting. And Aaron Stillinger makes the connection that the end is like the end from the lottery. Interesting. Nice, nice. Um, okay, so do you think it's possible? Do you think it's possible to get justice for Margot? What, what punishment would be fair here? What could the teacher do to make this up to her? Is it possible? And then my next question do you think Margot's family will return to Earth? And is it justice for her if she gets to go back where there's sun all the time and they have to stay in the rain? Like, would that be a form of justice? Um, curious what you think. Cookie says, the teacher could maybe have noticed her. <laughs> maybe that would be it. Okay. Oh, yeah, I love this hashtag justice for Margot. I think we're going to have, coming away from this short story class, we're going to have... Um, leech of despair which i think all those kids in the class were leeches of despair and then now hashtag justice for margo um yeah mm. so and and the ending is the same from the lottery the reason i'm making that similar is because it's like we don't see it we're just left to imagine it all right so here you go you guys this is what i think is the final the my most powerful takeaway not necessarily yours but my most powerful takeaway from this story is actually not the bullying uh, to me, the most powerful takeaway is this. This is a line from Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, Nature. And I, I, in this story, I cannot help but make the connection to Emerson, where he says, if the star should appear one night in a thousand years, how men would believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God which had been shown. But every night come out these envoys of beauty and light their universe with their admonishing smile. And we pay no attention. And I, I couldn't help but think of this because I think of this idea that we see the sun almost every day. I mean, it's overcast where I live today, but in general, we live in a sun drenched world. And how often do we take the time to appreciate that we live in a world where there's stars on nights that aren't cloudy, right, or light pollution. But if you're, if we live in a world surrounded by stars where a moon comes out and we have rivers and we have animals and we're just surrounded by all of these amazing, amazing, amazing things. And I think one of the things that this story asks us to consider is this question. It is, how can we more fully appreciate the things in our daily lives that others denied them would hold in awe. And it could be as simple as indoor plumbing, that you have a refrigerator that you can open and that you can take food out of, that you have a bed to sleep in at night, that you have electricity in your home. I mean, we have so many things. And I think that this story is an invitation to, oh, Plankster just said we're in quarantine and we took freedom for granted. Yeah, I think we did, right? I think we did. Um, so, yeah. So think about how can you, how can you do this? How can you more fully appreciate the things in your daily life that others denied them would hold in awe? And if you can do that, if you can do that, then you will make yourself more fully human and you will make yourself more happy way more happy. All right, let's look at our last writing rock stars. Okay. I want to give a shout out to this person before I jump into the individual responses. This is exactly how to ask a question. So this person put a question in a comment, like in the Google doc, right? I'd originally had another sentence in here to conclude this paragraph. However, I ended up taking out, what do you think? Why is this a good way to ask a question? Because the person doesn't just say, I don't get it. 
They don't leave all of the responsibility on the teacher. They say, this is what I'm considering. What do you think is the best option? Whether it is a math class, a language arts class, a science class, social studies class, a language, uh, like world language class, it doesn't matter what class you're in. When you're going to ask a teacher a question, you show so much respect for yourself and your teacher when you form a question like this. When you say, I'm considering doing it this way or this way, which way do you think is most likely to end up in a best result? Rather than just saying, I don't get it. Don't, those are like teacher's least favorite word. <laughs> so, all right, let's jump in the read. So I just want to give a shout out. That was a great way to ask a question. All right, so our first sample this is a fifth grader. I like the general idea and the phrase is intriguing, right? The phrase is intriguing. Um, this is a key I think about this. If a teacher takes five minutes to read and evaluate a paper and the teacher has 100 students, then that teacher is spending over four hours grading that, those papers, right? So you can imagine that that gets very old very quickly. If your paper is one that is actually enjoyable to read, the teacher has a moment where he or she remembers why they became a teacher in the first place. So be that student. Be that student. I will tell you what I do as a teacher. I'll bring my big old pile of essays home. And I will go through them. And I will find the kids who I know will have done a good job. And I strategically place them through the pile. Like I reorganize the pile so that I don't have to read 15 essays in a row that make me want to Google alternate careers for teachers. Be this kid. Be the kid who makes me think, oh, that's an interesting idea, right? Even though you may have won the gamble, you may have still lost. And several of you had that idea, but I love that idea. And this, I'm going to show you now the closing sentence that went with this. This was the opening. This was the opening. Here's the closing of the same one. The short story of the bet showed that even though the banker technically won the bet, the lawyer won wisdom that the banker did not win. Look at the connection. Look at the, the bet showed that even though you may have won the gamble, you may still have lost. And then after the student proved the point, says this, the short story showed even though the banker technically won, the lawyer won wisdom. So now it's like not just this general idea. Now we have this specificity. I have proven this in my essay. This is beautiful. It is a connection without just repeating. It was a connection with analysis. Beautifully done. All right, next sample. The banker, this is a seventh grader. I like this and I want to um, show you the steps I'd take if I were writing such a great line. All right, if I had this good idea, if I had this good idea, which is a good idea, that the banker was a prisoner of his greed and pride. Beautiful, beautiful. I will put you in the essay pile because I think you're amazing. All right, I would think to myself, what happens in the story that makes me feel this way? Like, why do, why do, how was I able to come up with this great idea that the banker was a prisoner of his greed and pride? What phrases from the story support that idea. Um, it doesn't have to be something that says he was a prisoner. You don't have to find those exact same words, but you can find words that indicate that he's trapped in some way. It can be more subtle. In this case, even the opening of the story where he's pacing in his room and the mood is so gray, that evokes feelings of being a prisoner. And so you could use something like that. But if you come up with a good idea, the question you should ask yourself, and I'm not saying that this writer didn't do it. I just think it's a good example of how you have a really good idea and what your next step should be. Your next step should be what made me think that and how can I share that? All right, then um, the next example, this is a 10th grader. It was so unexpected. The main theme of the story reminds me strongly of that of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, in which a being detached from humankind, after spending years learning about humanity, both from literature and personal experience, comes to the conclusion that the human race is deserving of his eternal hatred and vengeance. This was, this, this is what I mean by capturing the reader's interest. It, I would take out the reminds me strongly. You don't need that because I know it's you writing, but you, you don't need to refer to yourself. But I would take that little part out. But aside from that, right, the main theme rem it the remain the main theme of this story evokes the theme of frankenstein i read this and i was like yes right and some of you have seen me make that comment off to the side yes right yes beautifully done next sample at the end of the bet though strictly speaking um the banker won because the lawyer forfeited the lawyer gained much more from his sentence than the value of the two million dollars um, yes, this is a nice topic sentence, but this is what I want to say about this writer. This is a writer who has consistently spent a lot of time revising. This is, um, 
this is a writer who has done the hardest thing, which is the revising, and consistently done it, and it shows. And if you are ever discouraged with your own writing, remember that no matter what you want to be good at, it takes time and practice, no matter how naturally talented you are. You all have something worth saying, and it's worth saying well. All right, next. Um, next example. Yet neither man has won anything, not even the satisfaction of knowing they were correct. I read this and I was like, bam, right? Ooh, right? They don't even have the satisfaction of knowing they were right. And really, is there any satisfaction that exceeds that of knowing you were right? Oh, that was good. All right, ninth and 10th grade. If you were given, uh, this 10th grader wrote this lovely opening paragraph. Now, this is longer than what I would normally expect for a, a response like this. However, this student actually wrote a lengthy response and it could handle this opening. So I wanted to show you this lovely opening paragraph because if you're going to write a longer piece, like, you know, a four paragraph piece, five paragraph piece, this is a beautiful opening. Uh, notice this lovely thesis statement at the end. Okay, but if you were given the chance to earn $2 million for a couple of years in jail, would you do it? In the bet by Anton Chekhov, a young lawyer takes a bet from a banker exactly like that. This bet is between a lawyer and a banker stating that if the lawyer could handle 15 years in prison, the banker would pay him $2 million. In the end, although he lost the bet, the lawyer has the bigger win than the banker. Okay, so there's some repetition here, some plot summary. You could take out if you want to and make it smaller, but what I want you to show is if you have longer, you could do longer, but always put that that bam what is your thesis like what is your idea that you're trying to prove all right next i like this idea um uh, nobody won the bet because winning involves getting a prize or victory Th the idea is strong but here's what's powerful about this it doesn't say i think or i feel or i believe it just says it just say it just say it okay 11th through 12th grade um I, I threw this in. This was someone had put this at the bottom of the paper and several of you had done this. Put thanks in the docs. You left me notes. They made me smile. Um, and I want to say thank you very much. I've I've learned a lot from you guys. Okay. I want to take a, a student who is an 11th grader and who is a great writer, has worked really hard and done some great stuff this week. And I want to show how I would take already good and I would try to make it even better. So I'm going to show you a few sentences that this writer wrote that are all fine. They're all absolutely fine. Um, however, they could be even stronger. So the, the student is in black and my revision is in purple. So while the lawyer spent time in jail, he took the opportunity to learn. Absolutely true and absolutely fine. It's got a nice little um, clause at the beginning here. But notice how I'm changing it. Although the lawyer was the one who was imprisoned, he seized the opportunity to transform his mind. Because in this, in this prompt, you're trying to prove that one character changed and one didn't. So I want to emphasize this. So I'm going to use a stronger verb. So instead of taking an opportunity, I'm seizing an opportunity. Instead of learning, I'm transforming my mind. I hope you can see the difference there, right? Okay. <clears throat> then um, during the years of the lawyer's development, it is revealed how educated he has gotten. Ooh, I need to... Let me move my, um, let me see if I can move my face out of the way. How educated he's gotten. There we go. Sorry about this. I don't, oh, oh, wow, 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 wow. Sorry about that. This isn't, this isn't as easy to do as you would think. Uh-oh, I may have like really, oh, <gasps> sorry. I, now I've, oh boy. Okay, let's focus on this and then I'll try to fix it. Okay, during the long, so during the years of the lawyer's development, it is revealed how educated he has gotten. Okay, watch how I change it. During the long years of the lawyer's confinement, the narrator keeps a running commentary on lawyer's self-education. We see him studying, agonizing, pondering, and wrestling with the reading. You, I know you all know I love me some ING words. I love me some ING words. Okay, so that is, whoa, that is the last of it. And I am going to try to get, I'm going to try to get my face back here. Sorry, you guys. Sorry. I, it's a little bit tricky in this. I see Mr. Van is like spinning the chair around. Do you need my help? But I think, I think I could do it. I think I could do it. Okay. Um, oh, maybe I'm still a little bit too big here. Oh, I want to scare you. All right. There we go. Okay. Now. Woo. All right. Got to, got to save the technical difficulties for the last class. Okay, so I just want to give you guys a big shout out and a big thanks. This has been one of the most incredible experiences of my life, meeting all of you. And I just, 
have grown to, I look forward to seeing you every day and I'm really going to miss you. Um, remember, if you haven't already, be sure to sign up in the email so that you can be informed because whatever I decide to do, I will send you an email and you can stay tuned there. Um, and I'm going to leave Jay San with the last word. I love your teaching so much, Mrs. Van Star. Your class is the highlight of my day and I'm going to miss you a lot. And I would say right back at you. So Reiner Rilke, who um, was an author, said this. Ah, how good it is to be among people who are reading. And I would just like to say to you guys how good it has been to be around you as we have read these stories together. I will really, really miss you, but I look forward to staying in touch. I know that we will. So this is Mrs. Van Star signing off. I'll be in the chat for just a minute, but and, and we'll see each other again. But bye-bye for now.